I'm Chantelle Irwin, CEO of Arthritis Action. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us for our July webinar, which is about rheumatoid arthritis, all that you need to know. I'm delighted that our medical advisor and consultant rheumatologist, Dr. Wendy Holden, is joining us today, and she'll be speaking about all aspects of living with rheumatoid arthritis. How are you today, Wendy? I'm good, thanks, Shan. And hopefully today we're going to be talking about all things to do with rheumatoid arthritis, symptoms, diagnosis, shielding, and the latest uh, guidance on COVID, and of course, self-management. And don't forget to go to our website to see loads more resources. Excellent. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thank you to all of you for joining us today and for submitting questions in advance on rheumatoid arthritis. We'll be responding to them at the end of the webinar. If you have further questions you'd like to ask us during the webinar, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in your question. Then, time permitting, we'll answer all of them at the end of the session. If we don't have time to answer all the questions, then we'll be sure to email you with a response from Dr. Wendy after we're done. We'll be sending an email with further resources information on rheumatoid arthritis afterwards as well. So we'll jump right into the questions for today's webinar. The first set of questions, Wendy, are general questions on rheumatoid arthritis and diagnosis. So what is rheumatoid arthritis? Thanks, Shan. So the, the first thing I need to do is to explain what exactly is arthritis and what is the main difference between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. So firstly, osteoarthritis is, is often known as wear and tear arthritis by doctors. And this tends to be something that happens to people as they, they get older. It's common if you've injured a joint and it often affects individual joints. So for example, in this, in this picture here, the small joints of the fingers are affected. The most common places to be affected are the, the finger joints, the hips and the knees, but also the neck and the back. And it will be one of the most common reasons that, that patients will have uh, joint replacement uh, surgery. So um, this type of arthritis is completely different to rheumatoid arthritis, which is called inflammatory arthritis. So this isn't due to wear and tear. In inflammatory arthritis, there's a problem to do with the immune system, which is what normally protects us from the world around us. In rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system starts to turn upon ourselves and then starts to attack the joints and causes pain, stiffness and swelling. And most people are surprised to hear that rheumatoid arthritis can happen at any age, including to very young children or, or babies. It usually causes uh, symmetrical uh, joint swelling both sides and most commonly affects the small joints of the hands and the feet, but it can affect many, many, many different different joints. Now, this picture at the top is somebody who's just started to develop rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see this chap's got lots of swelling in his his knuckle joints there, and also in his wrists. Not in the end finger joints, but in the other in the other finger joints. And the photograph below is is somebody who decided that she didn't want to start any any treatment, and unfortunately, that's that can be what happens to people's hands. If the arthritis is very active uh, and if they don't to opt to have some some treatment so we really want to prevent that from happening if we if we possibly can so the aim of our treatment or really rather the aim of aim of um, uh, medical care really is to see people as soon as we possibly can as soon as symptoms start to get the treatment started so that we can prevent joint joint damage it, the sooner we get the treatment started the better the outcomes will be and as soon as the arthritis goes into what we call remission, then we aim to reduce the medication. And sometimes the medication can even be stopped in a very few people. So if you think you might have rheumatoid arthritis or if you know someone who thinks they might have rheumatoid arthritis, please get them to seek help as soon as possible. Your GP should refer you urgently to your local early inflammatory arthritis clinic and please insist on a referral if that if that hasn't happened so we aim to see everyone within three weeks of referral and hopefully to start treatment within within six weeks this has obviously been very challenging in recent times but um, most departments are still doing services by telephone and the services are certainly still picking up and people with inflammatory arthritis are going to be front of the list to be seen in clinic as as time progresses excellent thank you and what causes the swelling in rheumatoid arthritis? 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, as I said, the immune system starts to go wrong and starts attacking the joints. The immune system triggers the production and the movement of cells and fluid to the joints and the lining of the joint becomes inflamed or swollen. So in this picture, this is an arthroscopic picture. In other words, a picture that's been taken with the use of a small telescope. You've probably seen that on television, the surgeons do that. And the picture on the left shows a normal joint with the lining of the joint being nice and smooth. And you can't really see much of the lining of the, of the membrane. The synovial membrane is more or less invisible. In the picture on the right, the synovial membrane has become much more active. It's proliferated and it looks a bit more like seaweed and the redness is increased blood supply to the joint. And that's called synovitis, synovitis. And that means inflammation of the lining of the joint. And that synovial membrane then produces the fluid that causes joint swelling, uh, stiffness and, and pain. Thank you. And how is rheumatoid arthritis diagnosed? Well, it's a combination of uh, what the patient says, how the patient's feeling, what the doctor can see, and then investigations that are subsequently done. So firstly, rheumatoid arthritis causes typical symptoms of pain, stiffness and swelling. And the symptoms are almost always worse in the mornings. Stiffness in the morning can last for several hours or even until until the afternoon, but generally it gets better with a bit of exercise and towards the end of the day. Often people say that they can't make a fist or grip or undo taps in the morning, but this improves during the day. Some people with arthritis feel quite quite tired and generally unwell, so it can call people, cause people to go off their food and just feel a bit a bit off off colour. There may be some visible swelling in the in the fingers or in the in the other joints, the knees or the wrists or the feet, and the joints might be tender to to touch. Some people have a form of arthritis that comes and goes, so there's not swelling that's there all the time. So it can be quite useful to take a photograph if you have that type of arthritis, so you can show it to the doctor or the nurse when you come up to clinic. That type of arthritis, when the swelling comes and goes, is called palindromic rheumatoid arthritis and it tends to cause joints that swell up for a day or so then go away and then another joint swells up and, and goes away. In some of these people the arthritis will go away on its own without any treatment but it's still important to get your joints assessed if you have this type of problem. In terms of investigations uh, most people will have uh, blood tests done, uh, almost everyone will have x-rays done of their joints and some people may have in terms of blood tests, we're looking for several, several things here. So firstly, we're looking for what we call inflammatory markers, inflammatory markers. So they are measures of inflammation uh, that can actually be recorded in the blood. And we use two common ones. The first is called the ESR or the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. That's a slightly old fashioned measure, but it's still used to measure inflammation. And the next one is called the CRP or C reactive protein and that is a protein that we measure in the blood that, that also rises in, in uh, conditions that cause inflammation. So we measure, first of all, we measure the inflammatory markers. Next, we measure markers of the immune system being active and those are called antibodies and we've probably all heard a lot about antibodies in the context of, of COVID, but these are antibodies that are connected with rheumatoid arthritis. We have one which is called the rheumatoid factor, which is a slightly old fashioned one. And we have a much more modern one, which is called the anti-CCP antibody, the CCP antibody. So most people will have those blood, or all people will have those blood tests done if we think they might have rheumatoid arthritis, but not everybody will be positive for these blood tests. About 70% of people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis will be positive for one or both of these tests, but 30% will, will not, will be negative. And this is or can be called zero, zero negative, meaning uh, you don't have the marker in the blood for rheumatoid arthritis, but it is still rheumatoid arthritis. So after blood tests, then we do investigations. So x-rays will show the bones and not the soft tissues. And, and we usually like to x-ray people at the beginning and then intermittently x-ray people's joints through the course of their condition. Now, many people will have normal x-rays of their hands and their feet at the beginning, but we are looking for 
slight abnormalities which are, are called erosions. And in this, this picture on the left, you can see this is uh, somebody's left hand and then their, their little finger and their fourth finger of that, of that hand. The joint looks reasonably normal, but you can see in that index finger there, there's something called an erosion, which looks like a little tiny mouse bite out of the end of the joint. And that, that is a sign that rheumatoid arthritis is active and aggressive, and we have to get cracking with treatment if we see that at the start. The picture on the right shows more advanced erosions with some destruction of joints there. And again, that is what we want to avoid with treatment. So hopefully if we get the treatment right as soon as possible, then we will avoid that from um, happening. In terms of other investigations, ultrasound, which is the same, exactly the same scan that pregnant women have, although it's obviously done on the joints, can show up swelling inside the joints. And that's, that's very, very useful if we, we can't detect it from the outside. MRI is the type of scan that you have when you go inside the big, the big magnet, and that can cause up, cause, uh, show up swelling inside the joints. Now this image here is a picture of someone's knee from the side. At the top of the picture, the large, uh, long gray structure is the, the thigh bone, the femur bone. And in the lower part of the picture, it's the, the tibia, the lower bone in the leg. And far on the far left, it's the patella, the knee bone. Now, all of that white that you can see in that picture is either inflammation or fluid inside the joint. So that's either synovitis or synovial fluid in, in the joint. So that's the kind of picture that you can expect to see from MRI um, images. So that's it as far as investigations are concerned. Thank you very much. And what happens next when someone is diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis? Okay, so obviously we need to explain the diagnosis. And so next we get on, a, from a medical perspective, we get on to discussing medical treatment, which is generally divided into three main, three main groups. So first of all, we try to treat the symptoms, so to treat how people are feeling, especially the pain and the stiffness. Next, we need to treat the underlying cause. In other words, we need to treat the immune system, which has gone wrong. And then we need to treat some connected uh, conditions, especially bone health and cardiovascular health, uh, which, which are both issues with people that have inflammatory arthritis. And then, of course, from a medical perspective, we don't cover this nearly enough. A medical consultation will only be a very few minutes in the whole course of people's lives, but more importantly, self-management. Self so that's what we're... We're all about, obviously, arthritis action. In terms of treating the symptoms, the pain and stiffness and swelling, then we mainly use anti-inflammatory medicines there, also called um, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs. For example, ibuprofen that you can buy over the counter or naproxen and lots of others that are prescribed by, by doctors. Now, anti-inflammatories are all extremely effective, uh, very good for helping with the pain and stiffness, but there are lots and lots of side effects and potential complications and lots of people don't, can't, don't like, to, like taking them. So they cause problems with the stomach lining and can cause inflammation, pain and bleeding and even ulcers. They can contribute to high blood pressure. They can increase the risk of stroke and heart attack. And for all of those reasons, they should obviously be used for the shortest possible time and in the lowest um, possible dose. Although, as I said, they are very effective for short term use. Next, in terms of uh, symptoms, we've got painkillers or analgesics. That's another word for painkillers. We have weak ones, called, uh, which is typically paracetamol. And then we've got stronger painkillers, which are weak opioids, for example, codeine and cocodamol, which is paracetamol and codeine combined. And we've got stronger opioids such as tramadol and morphine. Now, the, unfortunately, all opioids are very addictive, have many side effects and often, unfortunately, don't work for the pain of arthritis. So we are really trying very hard to reduce the numbers of opioid prescriptions that we are, are using. And we're recommending that they're used only for short term use, if at all possible. Lots of people been have been taking opioids for a very long time, so it's not going to be possible to reduce those quickly. So if, you, if you're worried about, about this, please do it under medical supervision and reduce the, the amount of painkillers you're taking slowly. Now, lo lots of patients have unfortunately uh, gone into the situation where the doctors have stopped 
completely stop prescribing opioids when, when patients feel that these medicines work for them. So if that's happened to you, please go back to your doctor and negotiate because they do seem to work for some people. So if you're one of these people, try and reduce their use, but, but please, please negotiate. We're still allowed to use them, but obviously if they're not working, if you're still having pain, they're not working, so they need to be reduced. So that's uh, symptom control. Next is um, treating the immune system. Uh, so now here we've got three, again, three main groups of uh, treatment here. So we have what we call disease modifying drugs or DMARDs, DMARDs. So that would be typically methotrexate, sulfazalazine and lots of other drugs that you may well know the names of. We have drugs called biologics and small molecules, for example, etanercept or adalimumab, um, which are more advanced forms of treatment. And then we have steroids in various varieties. So they come in the form of um, uh, injections, either into joints or into muscles or as, as tablets. Now, these all work in slightly different ways. Uh, disease modifying drugs, they alter the way the immune system works. So if you think of your arthritis as being a bit like a weed, then uh, drugs like anti-inflammatories or painkillers will cut the top off the weed. So they'll treat the symptoms, but they don't get to the bottom of the, of the problem. Disease modifying drugs treat the cause of the arthritis. So in other words, they, if you think of it as a weed, they treat the roots of roots of the problem. Lots of people worry about taking disease modifying drugs and we've got some questions about those later on. But most people who take these drugs are absolutely fine. You will need to have blood test monitoring when, to have them, but, but they, are, they are safe provided they are monitored and provided you are, you are sensible. Biologic drugs are more advanced therapies that have been around now for about 20, 20 years and they are a step up in terms of the treatment usually given by injection, although some can now be given by, by tablets and they can all be very effective. They are expensive, however, so they are they're rationed and they are limited to the people who have the most severe form of arthritis. As I said, steroids can be given in very uh, in different forms. Uh, they are extremely effective in the short term, but they are very dangerous to have for long term treatment. So in other words, steroid tablets I'm talking about really there. So steroid tablets are very, very immunosuppressing and have got lots and lots of long term complications. So we try to avoid the use of those in the long term, but joint injections and muscular injections, which usually go into people's bottom or the top of their arm, are very safe and effective and not considered to be significantly immunosuppressing. So that's it in terms of treating the arthritis. And the last little section is about treating the associated conditions. So people with active arthritis are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So for example, heart attack and stroke. So it's very important that we manage these, these risks by, for example, keeping a check on your blood pressure. Um, uh, and your GP will often be doing these, these annual checks or these annual checks should be done at the the hospital. If your arthritis is effectively treated, then this cardiovascular risk goes back down to, to normal. So that's why it's important to try, treat active arthritis as well. Um, carrying um, extra weight is also associated with increased levels of inflammation in the blood. So we need to try and manage that. If you're carrying a few extra kilograms, we need to try and reduce your weight so that we can treat the inflammation in your blood effectively too. All people with rheumatoid arthritis can be at increased risk of osteoporosis or osteopenia, which are bone conditions that can cause increased risk of what we call fragility fractures. So that's a fracture that happens after a minor accident. So people with inflammatory arthritis need to have their bone health assessed at regular intervals and sometimes something called a bone density scan to check, to check the risk. So we'll be doing that as well. And uh, we will hopefully all be giving you advice on weight bearing exercise for your bone health and general exercise to do with an, uh, treating inflammation and active inflammatory arthritis. So that's it in terms of uh, medical management um, of inflammatory arthritis. Sorry, that's a bit of a long section, wasn't it? Speaking of exercise, that leads us really nicely into the next session. 
uh, which is next up, we have a few questions on self-management of rheumatoid arthritis. So are there any activities or exercises I can do to help manage my rheumatoid arthritis? Yes, definitely. So the most important thing to say is that remember to, that exercise can't damage the joints. So although the joints might hurt if you exercise, the more you exercise, the more your joints will benefit. Even better than that is that exercise has an anti-inflammatory effect. So we know that exercise can, can reduce levels of inflammation. Gentle exercise can reduce pain by as much as, as 30, 30%. So as much, in other words, as much as uh, strong painkillers like Cody. You don't have to do loads and loads and loads of exercise. Even small amounts of exercise can make a difference to your physical uh, and mental health. And anything that can be done at a gym can also be done at home using your own body, body weight or household objects. We'll be showing you how to do that in, in a little while. Ideally with exercise, we're aiming for a combination of things. So aerobic exercise, where you get slightly out of breath to improve your fitness. Resistance exercise, where you're moving your moving weights, in other words, using your muscles, which will stabilize the joints, and balance exercises as well. So try gentle stretching, like neck rolling, shrugging your shoulders, lifting your arms. And there are lots of exercise programs online, for example, chair yoga, chair tai chi, all sorts of things. And we, on our website, Arthritis Action, have got a great series of moving exercises that you can try simple limbering up, simple uh, muscle strengthening exercises. Um, we've also got lots of exercise resources, free classes that are running during, during the COVID pandemic. So, and so that girl there is um, exercising her fine muscles, you will see. Try exercising to music, which can help keep you going. Practice things, simple things like standing from sitting, uh, standing up from sitting when you're watching telly or st standing from dining chair, small squats. Try practicing your balancing when you're brushing your teeth, for example. Try and do 30 seconds on each foot if you can. And if you get really good at that, uh, shut your eyes. So obviously try holding on when you're doing that. We don't want anyone falling over. You can try marching on the spot, which is really good for bone health, and try lifting gentle weights like uh, cans of beans or bottles of water or bottles of sand. If that, if you find the uh, bottle light lightweights too easy, you can you can increase the resistance at at home. So loads of things that you can do at home. I've been practicing balancing while I brush my teeth since you gave me that advice, but I can't close, I can't close my eyes yet, so I have to keep working on it. Excellent. So. <laughs> Rheumatoid arthritis has negatively impacted my mental health. What strategies can help improve my mental well-being? That's a that's a really good question, especially in the current um, in the current climate. So many people with arthritis, especially at the beginning, struggle with low mood, feelings of isolation and, and loneliness. And this is completely normal, especially through, through the COVID. Um, mental health services are 100% still available and there are lots of increased mental health services available both online and on, on the telephone. So please make contact with your GP and if necessary, um, please, if you are feeling desperate, the Samaritans are obviously still available and uh, a mental health crisis is still a crisis, so the emergency departments are still available. Um, if you're not having a, a, an extreme mental health emergency, but you're just feeling low or a bit more anxious than normal, there's lots of things that you can do to improve your mental well-being and lots of support both on our website and, and elsewhere. So there's lots, lots of books on, on self-care. Everything, everything we say today is going to be available on, online. So there's some great books that I, I can recommend. One by Matt Haig, who called Reasons to Stay Alive. And he wrote that book with, uh, when he was struggling with, with depression. Maggie Van Eyck wrote, has also written a really nice book called Remember This When You're Sad, which is her strategy for dealing with her anxiety that she really struggled with. And she came up with an idea of when she was feeling a little bit better she wrote lists of things that helped her to feel good so that she could refer to them when she was feeling a bit more a bit more down so that's a useful a useful tip simple things we can do to make us feel better so counting our blessings or feeling grateful 
and online uh, or telephone support. So for example, through the Red Cross and HUK who've got a, a telephone befriending, brief, sorry, befriending service. Uh, Arthritis Action has got a positive wellbeing web page, which has got lots of, there it is, lots of these resources that we're, we're talking about. Uh, there are some great apps, including meditation apps through Headspace. I can, I can recommend that one, a really simple meditation app. Learning some mindfulness. So, for example, just being aware of, of what we're doing, being aware of our bodies, our breathing, what we're hearing, the birds, counting our steps, all can be very, very grounding and, and calming for us, for us. Doing some simple distraction things, so for example, art, music, puzzles, simple things, colouring, books can be can be helpful, or learning a new skill. Uh, writing a list at the end of the day on, on things that you've you've achieved. So just congratulating ourselves on, on small tip, on small successes can be really useful. Small acts of kindness can be really good as well. So phone somebody who you think you, you might need might need a helping hand or might need a chat can really be can really be helpful to improve our own self-esteem and remember you are not you're not alone so there's lots of help out there for you thank you the following questions will focus on diet and rheumatoid arthritis are there any diets or foods which help manage the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis that's a great question and that's often the first thing that people ask is there anything i can do to to help with my diet or is there any diet that i can follow so the simple answer really is, unfortunately, is no. There's no magic answer in terms of diet. There is no single food or diet that can make arthritis better or worse. And a balanced diet is always always best. But about three quarters of people with rheumatoid arthritis believes that believe that arthritis uh, a diet plays a very important role in their in their disease. Studies on diet are very challenging because. Trials on diet are, are very difficult. You're, you may be aware that when trials of diet are done, people usually get you to try and write down everything you've eaten. And although people have really good intentions, it's really hard to remember exactly everything that you've eaten in, in the course of a day. So just remembering is, is a major issue to do with trials. Dietary trials have either tend to have lots of small numbers or they're continued for a short amount of time. And there's often a very large placebo effect with dietary trials. So in other words, if you think you're doing something that will make you feel better, then it probably will make you feel better, but it may not be an effect of the diet. Fasting is very effective in controlling inflammatory arthritis, but it's unsustainable. So in other words, you can't continue to eat a very low calorie diet for, for long periods. So this is really not recommended at all. But obviously, if you need to lose a few pounds, then thinking about reducing your calories might be a, a good idea. There's some really interesting emerging evidence about gut bacteria and inflammation. And I think if you want more information about this, the best person to speak to or contact is, is, is Martin, our dietitian, who's got lots of thoughts about gut bacteria and, and diet. Now we all have lots and lots of different bacteria, hundreds or thousands of different bacteria in our bowel and no one has quite identified all of these bacteria yet. There are hundreds and hundreds that haven't yet been identified, but we all have a, a different fingerprint, if you like, so a different group of bacteria in our bowel. We know for sure that populations of people who eat a very varied diet with lots of fruit and vegetables, the more variety, the better have a much more varied gut bacteria than people who eat lots of processed food, lots of sugar and junk food, for example. And we think that the more varied the gut bacteria are, the healthier you're, you're, you we will be in general. And it's likely that if we can encourage good bacteria in our bowel, that may have an effect on inflammatory conditions, including arthritis. So, we generally try to increase the amount of bacteria that we've got in our bowel by eating more fiber and adding probiotics. So please speak to Martin about this. who can give you lots more, lots more information. In terms of diet in our, and arthritis in general, the Mediterranean diet has the most evidence, although again, this, this is, is limited evidence in terms of it controlling inflammation, but essentially a Mediterranean diet involves what this picture shows, lots of fruit and vegetables, whole grain cereals, extra virgin olive oil with reduced amounts of red meat and reduced meat in general and just small amounts of white meat. 
you can eat oily fish, lots of oily fish is good, eggs and try and avoid processed foods, especially pudding and carbohydrates. Um, studies on the Mediterranean diet have shown a modest improvement in arthritis in people who had stable and mild arthritis. We also know that omega-3 fish oils, which come from oily fish or supplements, are promising in reducing inflammation. High salt might be uh, pro-inflammatory, so reducing salt intake is a good idea. And if you are low on vitamin D, it's really important to correct that. And for most people who've been self-isolating and shielding through COVID, a daily vitamin D supplement has been advised because it means we've missed all the lovely sunshine when we've, when we've had it at least. So next, a summary slide here. Um, the Mediterranean, so in terms of healthy eating with arthritis, what we would like you to do is to try a Mediterranean diet if possible, omega-3 fish oils, lots and lots of fiber, probiotics, vitamin D and low salt. So no need to avoid tomatoes or peppers or anything like, anything like that. However, if there are certain foods that you find aggravate your arthritis, then obviously, obviously it's worth trying that, but, um, but you don't need to avoid anything in particular. Thanks, Wendy. So the next question relates to COVID-19 and shielding in relation to rheumatoid arthritis. Can you tell us the latest shielding guidelines meant for people with RA? Yes, I've looked up the latest uh, shielding guidelines this morning and the new rules will come into effect on the 1st of August. They are a source of confusion, un unfortunately. So at the moment, people with um, rheumatoid arthritis are still being advised to, uh, sh to, to shield to a, to a lesser extent. However, on the 1st of August, shielding uh, guidelines are going to be relaxed. And this, uh, this is straight from the government website. So although people who are immunosuppressed are still being advised to wash their hands and not touch their face and remain two meters away from people where, where possible, they will be allowed to go back to work provided their workplace is COVID secure, although of course they don't have to and they can remain at home if, uh, if, if they feel more comfortable like, like that. Uh, they will be allowed to go outside and uh, to get food, for example, to go to the shop and to take exercise, but should remain two metres apart if at all possible. The government are going to be devising, going to be devising um, individualised care plans for people that have inflammatory arthritis and that information hasn't been provided um, yet, but it but certainly is is coming. So we will have up to date advice on our website and other information can be through the British Society for Rheumatology website and also through the uh, through the ARMA website. So as soon as new guidance comes, that will be made available on the on the website. So so watch this space, in other words. Thanks, Wendy. So thank you very much. So we'll now spend some time answering any questions that you still have on the topic of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, as a reminder, if you haven't done so yet, just please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in your question and we'll be able to answer these for you. So I can see that we have a few questions already there. So well, Wendy, if you'd like to have a look and see if you can answer some of these, that would okay, be wonderful. Great. Thank you. We've got lots and lots of questions there. So the first one here is, when will rituximab infusions resume and is it safe? So that is a, a really good question. Lots of people are asking that. And I think unfortunately the answer is we don't know the answer to that at the moment. Rituximab is likely to be significantly immunosuppressing people for at least six months. So it's thought to be probably one of the least safe, um, safe drugs. So we, we don't know the answer to that at the moment. There will be some people who will still be having it because it is essential for them, however and they will have individual shielding adv advice. Okay, now the next question is, um, I was diagnosed, I'm gonna paraphrase, some of these are quite long. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in 2004. Um, somehow my notes were not forwarded to my GP. And when I had issues about six years later, I was sent to a different hospital. Eventually in 2019, so in other words, 15 years later, I was informed that I have fibromyalgia and not rheumatoid arthritis. So my question is, what is the difference? 
and why, um, why was the consultant at pains to diagnose fibromyalgia and not rheumatoid arthritis? Okay, so that's a good question. So what is the difference between fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis? So they have common symptoms and um, they are some of the, the, they do overlap quite a lot, those two conditions. Rheumatoid arthritis, as I said, was a, is a problem with the immune system, which causes joint damage if it's not treated. Fibromyalgia does not cause joint damage, but it does cause joint pains and lots of other pains. It's a problem to do with pain processing in the, in the brain, where the pain thermostat gets turned up, if you like. So some people with rheumatoid arthritis also have fibromyalgia, but, but they are not the, not the same question. So hopefully I've, I've answered that question. They are completely different and fibromyalgia does not cause joint, joint damage and it doesn't need disease modifying um, treatment. Um, okay, so I hope that's answered that one. Um, the next one is, um, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis 10 years ago when I was 54. I tried a couple of medicines which affected my liver so I was told by my rheumatologist I would be able to manage with painkillers. I've recently developed some problems with my eyes and gums. I know rheumatoid arthritis can cause problems in parts of the body other than the joints. And I've always wondered if that's caused my problems. Is that right or is it just me getting older? So that's a good question. So it sounds as though you've had rheumatoid arthritis for about 10 years. And... Um, if you've managed really well just with painkillers, that's that's really that's really really great news. Um, it sounds as though your problems are not due to any medication or due to the uh, the arthritis. It can cause problems in the eyes, um, but not the type of problems that you've you've mentioned. So I think unfortunately it may well be that your second part of your question that it could just be you're getting older and not like looking after your teeth. So sorry about about that one. Um, now, the next one uh, question is, I've just been diagnosed with polymyalgic onset inflammatory arthritis, and I've been started on methotrexate after about six weeks of pain and stiffness. I'm 62 and active, but I feel tired and miserable. Any advice about what I can do to get back to normal, or am I just being overly optimistic that I can lead a busy life? So that's a really, really great question. Thank you for that one. So. Um, and hopefully what I've just said has, has helped you with some of, with some of those, those issues. Polymyalgic onset inflammatory arthritis is where the arthritis tends to start with aching in the shoulders and the hips, which it, which it sometimes can, can do. It's great news that you've been started on methotrexate after about six weeks, so because that's exactly what we, we hope to do. And I'm really hoping that when the methotrexate gets going, which unfortunately it takes about eight to 12 weeks to get going, you'll feel a lot better. You'll be feeling much more like your normal self. Sorry that you're feeling tired and miserable about it. All that, as I said, is completely normal when you've just been diagnosed with arthritis, but that will hopefully settle when you feel a bit better in, you, in yourself. You're definitely not being overly optimistic. We would aim with medical management for you to get back to feeling completely normal and to be living a perfectly normal life. So. Try and be positive. The more positive you are, the better you're going to be feeling as well. So go to our website, look at all the self-help resources, because there's loads that you can do to help yourself as well. And if we get the treatment right, then you'll feel a lot better. Next question. Can you have both rheumatoid and osteoarthritis? Yes, you, you definitely can. So um, as, we, as we get older, lots of us have, have many problems with our, with our thumbs, for example, and our knees. I've got both of those problems, which is due to wear and tear. So we definitely can have all of those those problems. Next question, why do I feel tired all the time? So this is a very good question. So tiredness has got lots and lots of different um, uh, factors associated with it. So there's lots and lots of reasons that we might feel tired, obviously. If we're not sleeping, uh, we might feel tired. If we, if, our, if we wake up frequently through the night, if we don't have good sleep quality, we're gonna feel tired. If we're feeling low, we might well feel tired. Or if the arthritis is active, or if we've got lots of pain, we may well feel tired. We've got resources on our website um, speaking about fatigue as well. So it's, it's polyfactorial. In other words, there's lots of reasons for, for feeling tired. Obviously, medical reasons as well. So thyroid problems, feeling anemic. So get a medical checkup if you're feeling, if you're feeling tired. Next question is a good question. Can you get swelling and pain with wear and tear arthritis? 
Yes, you can sometimes. So sometimes um, an injury inside the joint or uh, can certainly cause uh, swelling. So for example, in the knee joints or in the fingers, there can be some increased synovial um, fluid. Uh, so definitely, yes, you can, but it doesn't usually look the same as rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, next question. I've heard many times that rheumatoid arthritis needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Is there a quantity of time whereby remission is not achievable via medication? In other words, that, that question is asking if, in other words, if it's, if it's, is it too late to get remission? So that's a difficult one because, as I've said, we, we aim to get arthritis into remission as soon as possible. So if you are if you are having some difficulty deciding on whether or not to to start some treatment please try and decide to take it as soon as you can because the sooner you start the medication the better you will be and the better the outcome will be so however at any time during the course of the disease we can we hopefully make it as as good as we good as we can but the sooner we start treatment the more likely we'll be we will be able to to get it into into remission. Okay, um, now the next question. If you have palindromic rheumatoid arthritis, when does a blood test show the inflammatory problems? Does it have to be done while the symptoms are there? So that, that's a really good question. So the question is about if the arthritis comes and goes, uh, does the blood test have to be for inflammation, have to be done while the swelling is there? Um, not, necess not necessarily. So sometimes inflammation is there in the blood all the time and sometimes it's, it's not. And in some people we have to capture it. So it's, that's an individual, uh, individual answer. So the answer is, is, is maybe, unfortunately. So we're more likely to capture an abnormal result when the, when the joints are swollen, but not necessarily. And the other slightly confusing thing is that sometimes blood tests can be completely normal. So so we try and capture them if they're abnormal, but they may never, they may never be um, abnormal. Um, next question is, um, I have read that there can be a vitamin D deficiency in patients on methotrexate should be, retake, should be retaking supplements. Well, vitamin D deficiency is extremely common, common anyway in our, in our population. And unfortunately in England, we don't get enough sunshine for most of the year to, in order to, to make ourselves full of vitamin D. Vitamin D mainly comes from sunshine. So many of us should be taking a vitamin D uh, supplement um, as, as, is, as is routine. Um, let's see if we've got... Um, question here about gabapentin for pain. That is a, a good question. And now um, gabapentin is a drug that was originally derived for um, epilepsy um, and has subsequently transferred over into the pain management um, group of, of medicines. It's a, it's a controlled drug, which means it's, it's in the same category as morphine and opioids because it has some very powerful um, side effects and it, it can be used as a, as a drug of um, uh, abuse and unfortunately it can be very effective for people who have nerve type pain so example for example uh, pain due to pressure on a nerve so for example tr uh, trigeminal neuralgia or nerve pain in the face but it's not very effective for the pain of of arthritis uh, can certain foods cause inflammation uh, for example gluten the jury is out on that and the, the global answer I hope I've answered that one is no, there are no particular foods that cause inflammation in um, arthritis. Gluten is a, is a different uh, uh, matter when we're talking about celiac disease, where obviously gluten is a different matter. Please ask Martin if you would like further information on, on, on that question. Uh, similarly, there's another question on turmeric there. Um, again, uh, go refer to our website. Um, I think I'll do a couple more questions. Um, are any food supplements promising for rheumatoid arthritis improvement? No, not other than um, omega-3 fish oils that, that we have already discussed. And there's a question there about CBD oil. I thought that that question would, um, 
would come up. Lots of people are buying lots of CBD oil and there is no evidence that it, CBD oil is um, effective for pain and that is why NICE don't recommend CBD oil for pain. So if you're going to try it, feel free to, to, to try it, but don't spend too much money because there is no good evidence at all that it is effective for pain. Um, this is, the, I think this should maybe be the last question, which is a good question about COVID and the vaccination. Uh, if a vaccine becomes available for COVID-19, will this be suitable for people taking methotrexate and sulfasalazine? That's a very good question. Um, people on disease modifying medication are already recommended to have the annual flu vaccinations and vaccinations every, every 10 years for pneumonia and you will most definitely be recommended to take the to have the COVID vaccination once it becomes available and it is thought that the vaccine will be made available first to people who who need it so for example people who are immunosuppressed and people on disease modifying medication will probably be at the front of the of the queue so those are some great questions there thank you for all of those Thank you so much, Wendy. That was a great set of questions. I learned a lot during that. So thank you very much. So this concludes our webinar on rheumatoid arthritis. If you'd like any more information on the subject or on any other forms of arthritis, please visit our website at arthritisaction.org.uk or feel free to give us a call. We have a number of useful resources that will help you self-manage your condition, including detailed information on exercises, dietary info, well-being resources, tips on staying connected. We also have a dedicated website page, as you saw, on COVID-19 advice and information. A video of this webinar will be made available shortly on, your, on our YouTube channel as well, and we'll be sure to send you in a link by email so that you can watch again. All that's left is for me to say thank you very much to Dr. Wendy for answering all of our questions, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. We really hope you stay safe, safe and healthy, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.